Morocco Egypt general manager. So it's my pleasure uh, to be the moderator of one of the most important sessions for the COP27, which is the decarbonization. We know such a topic is uh, one of the essential topic that's focused for all of the, the COP it was highlighted during the COP26. Uh, and here we are at uh, COP27 to discuss about uh, what had been implemented and what's needed to be, to be done as well to focus on the decarbonization. So I'm here with um, uh, my colleagues, three extension speakers, uh, which with uh, different backgrounds, with different backgrounds will be adding a great value to our discussion here today and will be telling us more what's the action needed for implementation. And as we can understand and we can see for COP27, our slogan this year is together for implementation. And we saw Her Excellency today in the morning, um, uh, all of the uh, actions that Egypt is taking nowadays to enhance the implementation as well, like what Her Excellency said, uh, Nuafi, which is a great program. I do believe that all of the private sector will be having a great, uh, a great value participating to the same. So let me pass to my colleagues here, and I'll give them a couple of minutes for each one of them to introduce him, himself or herself uh, and, um, and to introduce uh, the company as well. So let's start with Dr. Valentina, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Valentina Krechma. I'm Energy Transition Director at Capricorn Energy. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, so thank you very much for inviting me, especially for this decarbonization session. which um, uh, for, for this decarbonization session, uh, and I personally am very passionate about decarbonization. So uh, Capricorn Energy is an oil and gas producer. So we have a global portfolio of uh, oil and gas assets, both exploration uh, and production, including Egypt. Um, we are really passionate and deeply committed to being a responsible oil and gas producer. So what does that mean? Uh, well, that means that we take seriously all three letters in the ESG, so environment, society, and governance, as well as UN sustainable, uh, sustainability goals. Um, as part of that, uh, climate is extremely important, uh, and we are, as a company at the corporate level, committed to achieving net zero by 2040. And this is from uh, our equity emissions on an absolute basis. Um, and uh, we also have near-term and mid-term targets. So our near-term target is a 15% reduction on the same basis by 2025 and a 30% reduction by 20, 2030. Uh, so it is really important uh, for us to have also kind of clear strategy as how we do it, given that we are an oil and gas producer. Uh, the vast majority of our emission reduction is going to come from the actual operations uh, decarbonization initiatives that we have at the field level, where we have a very clear hierarchical approach to reducing emissions, which is avoid, reduce, substitute, sequester, and then also offset. And uh, on the corporate level, we have also uh, we are working, actually, uh, we are producing carbon offsets, working di directly with the developer in the United States uh, as well. So that's briefly from me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valentina. Uh, Mr. Hazem, please. Thank you, Hashem. Uh, my name is Hazem Gohar. I'm the uh, director of the Water and Resources Department in Dar al Handasa. Uh, we're a, Dar is a multidisciplinary international consulting firm. Um, we cover all the uh, disciplines of engineering, starting from structural, electromechanical, architectural, and we, we do projects from planning to inception. And I guess we, you know, since I, I joined DAR in the 80s, uh, our late founder used to say, uh, any project that we design, if it's not sustainable uh, beyond our lives, it has no value. And this was even before the, the term climate change came into the picture. So I've, I guess we've always been uh, uh, cautious about the sustainability and the environment. It touches in the heart of everything we, we do. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is coupled by, uh, you know, uh, latest technological advances in the design, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, sustainability measures that we implement in most of our projects. Uh, I think uh, the message is in DAR, 
you know, all our projects, they touch upon people's lives. And we always care about the people and we want to improve the quality of the life of the social environment that they live in. So this is, you know, it's not a luxury anymore. We've all seen and the, the climate changes, how it's affecting uh, all of us. So uh, I guess it's not a luxury anymore. We're all under one roof and we all have to work together to make the most out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Hazem. John, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John Pearson. I run the new energy services portfolio for a company called Petrofac. Implementation seems to be the word of the day. So we're the implementation people. Um, what do we do? We uh, design, we build, we operate, we decommission energy facilities worldwide. And when I say new energy services, for us, that's five main buckets of activity. Offshore wind, which we've been doing for well over a decade now, carbon capture, utilization and storage, hydrogen of any color, waste to value. So for us, um, plastics to biofuels, etc. almost anything to biofuels, frankly, and emissions reduction, which we'll no doubt talk about a little bit later on in this panel. And frankly, a great place to start where we're probably not starting fast enough as an industry. Um, for us, crucially, a lot of the projects in the energy transition need to be delivered EPC lump sum for project finance. And that's what we do in a world where relatively few people do that. But I think even more importantly, our model is to get in and partner really early with our customers because this, this is difficult stuff, right? It's first in class a lot of the time. It, it, it requires a long-term working relationship. You can't just write it all on a piece of paper, issue a bid, get a price and go. And for us, it's super important to partner. And we also think it's super important to operate afterwards if people want us to do that, because the job doesn't deliver value until it's actually operating. And so I think a partner who wants to hang around for that phase should be quite attractive to our customers. Thank you very much, John. So, um, and thanks for the quick, uh, quick entry, everyone. So I'll start with Dr. Valentina. I just highlighted now, you have a short-term goal and you have a long-term goal, which will be started by 2025 and 2030. So how will the current global energy and the political economical situation will impact the decarbonization implementation? Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's a great question. Well, let, let me kind of try to answer it from a global perspective to, to begin with. Um, so clearly, we have compounding crisis currently. We have an economic uh, uh, energy crisis, we have food crisis, and all of this is going to have detrimental effect on global deca decarbonization. Um, it is clear that uh, the war in Ukraine um, and energy crisis that actually followed has also accelerated energy transition efforts. So actually we have a slightly bizarre situation that the energy transition has both accelerated and decelerated at the same time. Uh, with the Euro European Union on, on one hand committing to quadruple their investment in clean technologies and transition as fast as possible and stop dependency on Russian gas, etc. But on the other hand, we have increased the use of coal in the European Union. We are actually using more polluting uh, technologies. So in the near term, for sure, we are going to have uh, kind of a lot of detrimental effect. And we are going in the wrong, wrong direction. Uh, oil and gas demand is actually on the up and emissions are on the up. We are truly uh, the, the challenge of decarbonization was absolutely enormous even before this crisis started, even before the war started. And just to illustrate, and this is there is actually a consensus to, uh, across a number of different um, uh, research analytical agencies. And IEA has issued their new global energy outlook, world energy outlook just recently. And even in their base case scenario, and they're more optimistic than others, even in their base case scenario, oil and gas is going to continue to form a very significant part of the mix in the base case scenario. So currently, 85% of global energy demand, primary energy demand, is in fossil fuels, 85%. So in IEA's base case scenario, this is going to be six, is it's going to go down to 60% by 2050. This is not going to get us on the path to net zero. 
we are so far off net zero. We are going to get to 2.8 degree warming by 2100. This is based on the, all the current policies that we have now. This is based on Fit for 55, Repower EU, IRA, you name it, all the commitments that have been done in COP26, 200 countries committed. This is all embedded in this scenario. We are not going to get 1.5 degree scenario. So it's a huge, huge challenge. And who is going to pay for it? How much is it going to cost? Well, estimates, they, they range from from 125 trillion to 275 trillion, depending who who is estimating it. You know, we have we have heard from a couple of speakers, Your Excellency, this morning, Rania, um, a gentleman sort of in the previous panel as well, talking about this huge in in how we match actually supply and demand for for funding. Um, well. <laughs> These were questions, but we don't have answers how to match it. And truly, when we look as a company that is looking to, to invest in clean projects, the finance, GFANS, 135 trillion available, well, it's only available if it makes commercial sense. It's only available if it makes money. It, it's only available if it makes returns. It's not available otherwise. And this is the big problem. We need to be open and realistic about where we are heading. So is it going to be a challenge? Yes, it's going to be a challenge. But is it going to be a challenge for us uh, in, in Egypt? I don't think so, because we are committed um, to producing oil and gas and decarbonizing our operations and we are very fortunate and lucky uh, to actually have these initiatives already in place um, and we have a clear path to, to achieving this net zero. So we can talk about that sort of during the session as well. But, you know, there are so many things that actually we can do to help accelerate decarbonization efforts, to help accelerate and actually try to achieve this, get as close to net, to net zero as possible just by doing decarbonizing is existing existing operations thank you yeah thank you valentina it's very interesting that um, with all of these initiatives that we are doing it will be the reduction will be only to 60 percent on fossil fuels by 2050 so and the gap definitely based on the funding so let me move to hazem and um, maybe it's a focusing for for the funding and the climate change as well for the slow movement economy countries so as you know, for the COP27, all of the focus will be for the climate finance and the climate adaptation. What are the practical hurdles do you see in implementing the green finance that can support the countries with a slow movement economy to achieve and reduce their current emissions? Well, in my opinion, you know, um, green uh, finance on its own would not solve the problem. Uh, uh, it might help, uh, uh, you know, the poorer countries, but definitely if it's not coupled with uh, raising awareness and uh, having the uh, policies and guidelines in place together with the technological advances, we're not getting anywhere. So we have to move on all three fronts, really. Um, uh, raising the awareness is a, extremely important. People should be aware that we have to act to act and move from uh, pledges and promises to implementation. Uh, re setting the policies and the guidelines is very important because unless you have a framework in place, you know, people will not respect it. And then uh, coupled with the technological advances, and we need to make sure that we enable the stakeholders, as we were discussing earlier with Dr. Valentina, that they should recover part of the cost because if, we, if we're just asking them to, uh, to pay upfront costs, you know, they would not do it. Uh, while uh, climate, you know, green economy can help uh, poorer countries, but, you know, uh, we have seen like in emerging uh, uh, markets, you know, people care about the uh, upfront costs rather than the long-term benefits. So uh, it's very important to allow them to recover part of the cost. Unless we do that, you know, we would not get anywhere. And of course, all this, if it's not within technological advances and innovations, which has to continue to grow, so that we can achieve the net zero carbon with, you know, minimum uh, implications and cost burdens on the on the stakeholders. That's in my opinion. 
Thank you very much, Hazem. So as, uh, as Her Excellency said in the morning, moving from pledged promises to implementation, let me, let me move to John. John, how could Petrofax support the decarbonization? And as we just highlighted now, moving to the implementation, what is the percentage of the implemented of these initiatives, initiatives within Petrofax? So put crudely and slightly glibly, if you do the pledges, I'll do the implementation. And we, we, we talk about decarbonization like it's some huge complicated thing. You don't decarbonize by talking, you decarbonize by doing. And the barrier is people sometimes think the barrier is a massive technological one. For sure there are, you know, we're pushing the boundaries of various technologies, but the barrier to getting started is not a technological one. We just need to, and I'll talk about that later, I'm a project guy. I like a plan, I like to know what's stopping my plan, and then I like to fix the things that are stopping my plan. And if we spend all our time talking about other stuff, funnily enough, the project doesn't go to plan. So let me come back to that later. But how can Petrify help? We want to do, and you need people to do, otherwise we don't decarbonize. A little bit more deeply, you know, have, have we got skills to help? Yeah, absolutely we have. What technologies do we need to deploy? Um, green hydrogen, green ammonia, for sure. Carbon capture, for sure. Um, biofuels, quite possibly, depending on where that fits in the mix. And certainly emissions reduction. I mean, that's like the place to start. The good news is we're working on all of these topics. Um, we're working on some of these topics right now in Egypt uh, with MEP. We're looking at some of the, the green ammonia developments and we're actively bidding into the market. So we're trying very hard to get engaged, but... <laughs> To Valentina's earlier point, we need real projects that are going to go ahead because otherwise we're just talking, we're not doing. Um, and how do we support? And I, I will repeat myself, it's get in early. It's work with customers who want to work with us. We need to find people who want to share the risks. Sometimes there's no technical risk. Often there's an economic or commercial risk because a lot of these projects aren't fully commercially viable. You have to take a view on the economics five or 10 years out, or you have to do them as a sustainability thing for your business. And, and we, need, we need to collaborate on real projects. And that's, I guess we're all frustrated at the pace of progress, but frustration is pointless. You need to turn frustration into action because then you don't, you're not frustrated anymore. <laughs> and we tend to talk a lot about the frustration rather than what would overcome that and, and get on with it. So I'm, I'm I stand ready to help. My guys are here, form a queue afterwards, and we'll be ready to work with you on any project you've got. Thank you, John. So with my experience with the Egyptian market, I can confirm to you there is um, always a project which we can focus as a private sector on it. So, and getting back to find a real project, uh, Valentina. So all of, uh, all of the focus now is to find the source of reliable, sustainable, and affordable source of power. So in this trilemma, What's the priority of the sustainability from your perspective? Well, balancing uh, the triangle, the energy transition triangle, which looks into the security of energy supply, affordability and sustainability um, is, is a Herculean challenge, right? Uh, as we're going through uh, the current crisis, we are seeing shifting priorities. So before the war in Ukraine, uh, the focus has definitely been on sustainability. And we made a big mess of not focusing on the security of energy supply. This is why we are in the mess that we are. After the 2014, 2015 price crash, oil price crash, and the, you know, the, the, that, that, that led prices falling uh, from 100 to less than $50 per barrel. The global spend in upstream industry was halved, and it never recovered. It never recovered since then, because on, um, on returning to shareholders, capital discipline, there was also this element of actually not daring to invest because the uncertainty around the energy transition uh, grew over that period. And when we talk about investors now, uh, very few people even talk about investing in oil and gas. No one wants to invest in oil and gas anymore. And that is a big 
because there is a serious underfunding in the global oil and gas industry, right? Uh, we know that we need to now focus on uh, energy security because we are in the energy crisis. What I would say is that even though we are in the energy crisis, we must not put sustainability aside because we can, we can do things differently. So if you are sanctioning new projects, sustainability has to be the core element of these new projects. And then, as John was saying, we have huge amount of oil and gas currently that's produced uh, globally, for example, that also has to be looked from the sustainability perspective. So we, we, we have to embed sustainability into the energies of security of supply. And in many ways, uh, security of energy supply, and this is very much what underpins the European Union strategy, uh, security of energy supply is investment in clean energies, etc., and sort of dependency uh, on fossil fuels. But I, I was at a conference recently when I heard a, a very wise Chinese gentleman say, that he said, you Europeans are very funny. You're trying to knock down your old house before you've built a new one. And that is a great metaphor. This is exactly what we are trying to do. We are trying to knock down our old house before our ready and our new one we've just laid the foundations for the new one there's still all the permitting to come and lots of things to do so we can't stop investing in the old house we have to continue investing in this old house because it's its roof has just been blown off we need to replace that roof because we still need to live in it this is, this is the real realization that we all have to have and these are pragmatic, realistic approaches to the security of energy supply. We need to start talking energy real politic, and maybe let's coin a new phrase, real energy, something like that, where actually we deliver pr practical, pragmatical solutions to decarbonization. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valentina. So as we are focusing on the uh, private sector, uh, I'll be moving to Hazem. Uh, so, do you see the COP27 pushing for an even greater contribution from the private sector toward the climate and development objective? So, if you can let us know how DA will be supporting that uh, that initiative. Yes, definitely, uh, uh, COP27 will lay the foundation. As long as we have uh, the awareness and the policies in place, the demand will follow. Because once you uh, start uh, uh, setting the guidelines and the framework, uh, people, that's hence the private sector contribution will, will, will be enormous in developing the technologies and in, in making uh, things happen. Uh, like John was saying, you know, we, we, we talk the talk, but we need now to prove that we can walk the walk. So it's very important that the private sector should jump in, support all the initiatives, the, the, the sustainability measures that Valentina was talking about. We need to support that with the technology and the design that can support and make things happen. Uh, for example, you know, relying on the, um, one of the examples that we have developed recently in DAR is um, artificial intelligence uh, 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 for the smart operation of buildings. Uh, so this is not only for new buildings, but for existing ones as well. And I liked what uh, Valentina said about, you know, our old house. So we need also to look at how we can improve the existing uh, buildings and the existing infrastructures. We shouldn't just be focusing on new projects, but how we can retrofit and rehabilitate existing buildings and existing infrastructure. And with simple um, measures like relying on artificial intelligence, sensors, smart meters, and things like that, we can optimize the operation of a lot of infrastructure and buildings that are already there. So I think there is an enormous role to play for the private sector in making things happen. And I, I'm hoping that, you know, uh, as we said earlier, we move from pledges and promises to implementation. That's the key thing to make success. Thank you very much, Hazem. I, I, can, I can see that the, the artificial intelligence has been mentioned several times, even during this panel or, or the previous panel. So maybe just continue with you, Hazem, as well. What do you think the applicable percentage of applying the artificial intel intelligence 
will be applicable to be applied for all of the sectors like oil and gas, agriculture, um, even the water, like what we hear today in the morning. So, and what will be the impact of the same for such topic, what we are discussing I today, the decarbonization? Be applied, applied across the board among all sectors, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's very diverse. And, you know, uh, for example, you know, in the water supply se sector, uh, leakage is a major challenge you know we have 50 60 percent of our water resources are lost through leakage so by having artificial intelligence and smart meters that can measure and stop the leakage this is an enormous achievement in buildings you can optimize the operation as i said energy bills uh, you know in the oil and gas you know uh, extraction uh, having um, all uh, controlled and uh, tied to scada systems and bms building management system all this can you know, it would be relying on artificial intelligence and smart solutions. And that's the future. It's just, we cannot ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Hazem. So let me move to John. And um, as we know, over the last two years, the whole world is suffering from a lot of challenges, starting from the COVID-19 to the uh, recent uh, war between Russia and Ukraine, and the hyperinflation took place all over the world. One of the main um, uh, sectors or department have been affected, which is the supply chain. So what do you think the skills needed for the supply chain sector to overcome all of these challenges and to maintain the decarbonization level that we are discussing about? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I remember one of my customers a few years back observed that 80%-ish of what every company does is actually done by their supply chain. So nurturing your supply chain is a, is a critical theme that I'll come back to. But before I dive into the answer, let's go back to the background. You're exactly right that um, supply chain generally, and supply, supply chain is a massive thing, right? But supply chain have had a really tough time over the last five or six years. And I, I go to lots of UK government meetings where everyone's talking about exceptional profits and all the rest of this. And I have to remind them that I make profit through activity, not through oil price or gas price or something like that. So the supply chain is really, it's on the up, but it's still in quite a fragile phase. One last piece of background. We, we said earlier that you decarbonize through doing real projects. To do a project, I have to help my customers make their investment decision. To make an investment decision, you obviously need lots of things, but you know, in, in, in the world of new energies, government support is very helpful. Having permits in place is exceptionally helpful. Having a risk tolerant investor or money that is not contingent on utterly normal project financing, that's very helpful. And you might think this is really obvious, but it isn't in a lot of cases. Having a supply and offtake set of agreements in place is also pretty handy. So if that's the background, what skills do the supply chain need to have? And I hope this doesn't sound rude or arrogant, but I think the supply chain need to be incredibly careful in which projects they pursue. Because in my experience, everyone's very excited. Everyone is very well-meaning. They're trying to make things happen but quite a lot of projects fail at least one of those criteria that I listed a minute ago. And even in very established sectors like offshore wind, there are lots of projects that are in the market that don't have permits, that don't have offtake agreements, don't have grid connections, et cetera, et cetera. So um, proper, proper conversations between the customer and the supply chain. And then for me, between my supply chain and the sub-supply chain is really crucial so that we can use our very limited investment capital and human capital on things that will actually translate to the real world and make a difference. That's super key. Um, I think I've overstressed partnering early, but this is not something like ordering a pint of beer in a bar. It's a lot more complicated than that. You have to work together for quite a period of time. Last couple of things. Um, there's a really important element of integrating a global and local supply chain. Lots of people call it the just transition. Um, so you, you don't just cause good things to happen for the environment and for energy security, but you to, to make these projects work, you have to source globally, but be exceptionally thoughtful about what you do locally. And not just local content, but actually local skills development so that you leave the, for me, the engineering or construction supply chain in a country in a better place than you found it. 
it becomes more capable and that you invest not just in you know, buying something locally that just passes right through, but you, you leave that country and the skills of its people in a better place. And I, I would really encourage any customers in the room to be thoughtful about that when you're choosing your supply chain partners, because that, it, that, that requires investment. It's very hard to be the cheapest and do all of that in the real world, if we're being honest. And so you get what you, you, know, you, you get what you manage, you get what you pay for. If you want these good things and your bid analysis doesn't put any weighting on them, guess what? You're going to train your supply chain that you don't mean what you say. And the very last point, um, th there will be lots of technology companies in the room, but even technology is rooted in smart people. We're in the good news. This, this is going to be one of the best markets, certainly of my career. Now, as you can tell, I've been around a few years, um, but that is delivered through human capital. So looking after the talented people in your company, investing in them, giving them an, an employment proposition that fires them up to come in in the morning and really give discretionary effort in in a market which sometimes is horribly cynical it's lowest price wins and just get the job done and, and it's a hard hard business we're in but inspiring your people i think has never been more important so i think that's a core skill for success in the next period thank you very much john so as the cop 27 happening here in egypt so let's bring it home and uh, get some question about Egypt as well. So I'll start with Hazem. How significant Egypt presidency for COP27? It's very significant for Egypt to show and reflect its commitment, uh, not only to the climate change, but also to spotlight, you know, what, what we can do for Africa and the Middle East and North Africa, MENA region. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, there are lots of technological advances in, in Africa, especially in the solar and the renewable energy. But um, I think uh, Egypt will focus the light on what we can do more. And uh, the fact that uh, we have lots of land so we can pilot test a lot of renewable technologies and, and, and projects. This is what, how we can help, you know, MENA region and Africa uh, to support the, the various technologies. So I think it's very important to, to, to reflect the commitment, show that we are totally committed and help others in the process as well. Perfect. Thank you very much, Hazem. So, Dr. Valentina, as a Capricorn, one of the um, one of the investor nowadays in oil and gas in Egypt. So, what can Egypt do to help accelerate decarbonization efforts? Um, thank you for that question. So, Egypt, um, I guess, is is doing quite a lot already. Um, we've heard from previous speakers about ambitious goals on renewables, quadrupling uh, basically renewables capacity for the electricity sector, so growing it from 10% to 42% by 35. We've heard about 15, 16 MOUs being signed on green hydrogen in the Suez economic zone. And, and that, that's great, that, that's the new house, that's building the new house. A couple of challenges that I would like to put out there, and I, that was one of my questions yesterday uh, as well. Um, in, in incentives and opening demand uh, are really key because these projects, in order to take off, they need to be commercial. So uh, I know there is uh, very, not not always very it's not always very comfortable talking about incentives, but they're they're really very important. What we are finding as a company is that. Uh, jurisdictions that actually offer incentives, whether government subsidies or whether carbon taxes, um, are actually for us only jurisdictions where we can um, really sort of uh, get sort of projects uh, on a more economic and commercial uh, commercial scale. So it's really important to think about these uh, these uh, areas uh, that when, when we talk about new projects such as hydrogen, etc. On the other side, on the decarbonization side, so looking at the old house, uh, there is a lot that we can do as well. Uh, and it, this is not just for Egypt. I, I think globally we have to rewire fiscal systems and enable oil and gas producers to actually decarbonize their projects by actually allow, allowing tax terms that will be 
that will be conducive to, to, to these kind of actions. And that means cost recovery, that means uh, being able, and, and I think uh, Hazan was talking about it earlier, that, that is really, it's really important to embed decarbonize, uh, decarbonization projects into fiscal terms. And we are all just writing this handbook. We are just at the beginning of the process. So uh, we haven't, there are, there are only a, a handful of jurisdictions around the world that have actually done this. Um, and I would name maybe Indonesia and Malaysia uh, that have actually embedded in some, in certain projects, they have actually embedded carbon capture and storage costs in the fiscal terms when they are considered at the field level. And these are the kind of, uh, incentives that I think producers will need to see to actually really uh, start implementing these projects at scale. So, thank thank you, Martina. Maybe I'll be adding um, a small question, not a question, but a clarification maybe from your side. As we know that um, Egypt, especially the oil and gas sector, participating for the zero flaring by 2030. So how do you see that uh, Capricorn participating for this initiative and what is the implemented project that's adding value to the same? Yeah, absolutely. So Capricorn was the first UK com company that actually committed, EMP that committed to zero uh, routine flaring by 2030 as part of the World Bank initiative. And this is our commitment uh, in Egypt as well. Uh, as part of our decarbonization effort uh, in Egypt, uh, we are actually uh, reducing flaring. Uh, we are using that gas to generate power um, and reduce emissions by actually stopping uh, diesel generation uh, as well. Uh, it makes sense for the planet. It makes se sense in terms of OPEX savings as well. Uh, so these are all kind of practical projects. As, as John was saying, it, it's, not a, it's not a rocket science. Uh, it's actually, as one of my colleagues says, the unsung heroes of the energy transition are the people going around and sort of, you know, tightening valves to stop uh, methane venting, et cetera. So uh, we need to focus more and we need to reward um, and encourage these kind of operations at the field level because uh, we have to recognize that we will need oil and gas for at least another couple of decades. So let's start in earnest decarbonizing these operations. I, I trust that this is uh, considered one of the main topics, especially for arranging the current house, if you want to, to build a new house and optimizing our cost and adding value, because the value proposition of shifting from the conventional diesel uh, generator to the gas generator, this will be definitely adding a huge impact even for the oil and gas operator. So let me move to, to John. Yesterday during uh, one of the panels, His Excellency Dr. Ra Dr. Walid was highlighting Egypt signed uh, several MOUs for the uh, green hydrogen and the, the blue ammonia. So why Egypt is well positioned as a, as a focal player for that sector? Well, I'm, I'm an engineer, so forgive me, but I like tick lists. So if I was doing a tick list of what you need to be well positioned for green hydrogen, green ammonia, I'd go, right, we need uh, low cost renewable energy, which usually means wind or solar. Well, tick tick right got that you need infrastructure so you need a grid you need pipelines you need ports yep we've kind of got that that's good you need lots of space because wind projects and solar projects need space yep we got plenty of space you need a supportive government environment we've definitely got that I mean, you can always ask for that uh, policy support to turn into practical fiscal support quicker because and it does frustrate me that companies are commercial entities with shareholders. The, the officers of the company have a fiduciary duty to do the right thing for their shareholders. So they can't do illogical stuff. They've got to have decisions which are either commercial now or soon be commercial, otherwise they won't take them. So motivated government, tick, but keep the support coming, I would say. You also need export routes because you know, it, it's fine doing small scale green, but if you want to do really large scale green, it has to go somewhere. And you're really, really well positioned here in Egypt. You, you can access Europe, of course, but the Asian market is about a you know, factor bigger than the European market. So great, you've got that. And as a last plug, don't forget carbon storage. Um, carbon storage as a business, and I see lots of my customers going, oh, I've got an old asset, I'm going to have to decommission it. 
that's a lot of balance sheet drag. And they've suddenly gone, hang on a minute, I've got an old asset. That's a carbon storage opportunity. Carbon storage is good as a business on its own, but it's really good because it allows you to do blue hydrogen quickly whilst you're on a path to doing something else and you can store the carbon for that. So I would say nine out of 10 on my tick list for, uh, for Egypt for green ammonia and green hydrogen. Thank you very much, John. So back to you, um, uh, Hazem, and uh, specifically about the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. What impact will Sharm el Sheikh Pact have on Middle East and Africa? Well, again, I think, uh, you know, uh, we will start seeing, uh, we should start seeing implementation and things happening. And, uh, you know, uh, with all the commitment of the various uh, attendees and stakeholders, uh, you know, uh, they will all, they're all committed just the fact that they're present and, and committed, uh, you know, we, we should be seeing uh, things happening in the near future. Uh, for example, Dari, you know, has signed um, the Net Zero Commitment Initiative with the U.S. Uh, Green Building Council. So uh, by 2030. So, I mean, and Valentina said Capricorn as well, you know, signed the Zero Carbon Initiative. So, so we're, we're seeing collaborative effort among all fronts. Uh, and, you know, again, as I said, you know, it's not a luxury anymore. We have to start doing things and seeing things happen. So I think, uh, you know, implementation is the key word. We need to start physically implementing what we have been talking about. Thank you very much, Hazem. I'll take the last word that you just mentioned, the implementation, and I'll be uh, direct my question to three of you and appreciate because of the time, if you can give me in one minute, uh, quick, as we are looking for the real implementation, what do you think needed to make sure that we have a progression and achievements from COEP 27 to COEP 28 in Dubai? So maybe I can start with Dr. Valentina. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, for, for me, it's really focus on uh, decarbonization because we need to clean up the old house. Uh, the the, the the stream where we are mitigating and investing and providing vision on new technologies, new energy, absolutely needs to carry on, right? But uh, for us in the oil and gas industry, and I'm talking from that perspective, uh, really the focus has to be on decarbonizing ex existing assets uh, and making sure that when we go into new ones, they absolutely, absolutely have sustainability embedded uh, in every aspect of, of this project. Thank you, Valentina. So, Hazem, please. For me, I think it's energy transition. Uh, we, we, we have to invest more in renewables. Um, again, as uh, uh, Valentina mentioned, we will still rely on, you know, uh, uh, fossil fuel, definitely, but we need to shift and start relying more on uh, uh, renewables. Uh, solar is a big thing, photovoltaic cells. In Dar, we have been designing buildings totally on solar and even pumping stations and treatment plants. So the future will see a lot of reliance on uh, wind, uh, turbines as well, solar. Uh, we've, we've submitted proposals even on um, extracting energy from tidal effect, from tidal waves, you know. So there are lots of opportunities to invest in, in innovation, in energy transition. Uh, and I think that's the future. It's worth investing uh, in, in, in this technology. Thank you, Hazem. John, please. To finish by quoting Top Gun, <laughs> don't think, just do, right? And you, you want to make progress? Progress, with the greatest respect, isn't conferences and papers and PowerPoint. Conference is doing stuff that decarbonizes, right? That's what we need to do. And it's like ridiculously crass to say we need to make progress by doing, but it's not a technological barrier. Find the things that are stopping us, talk about them properly, and don't get frustrated, turn it into action. Thank you, John. I'll, I'll give my, um, my opinion for the same, for enhancing the implementation. And if I'll be, uh, if I'll be highlighting the main um, decarbonization, it will be having main four pillars. The first one, which is improving the energy efficiency by reducing the energy consumption while delivering the same value of the energy itself. The second one will be reducing the emissions. And this one by utilizing the available technology, same like what um, Hazem was saying, we have the artificial intelligence that we can use, we can give all of the inputs and we definitely will be getting a great result. The third one, which increase the reliance on the new energy source, same like John was saying just now. 
and we can activate more hybrid. We can start with even the hybrid solution. Don't need to be 100% renewable. We can start by hybrid, hybrid solution. We can reduce the emission, and this will be having a great impact on immediate basis. The last one, we need to encourage investment in more low carbon um, technologies, like the renewable and all of that. So that's it from our side. And um, I wish that you have a, a, a good understanding of the decarbonization. And please feel free to have any kind of question. Yeah. Okay. okay. Look, th panel, thank you. Um, what, what, what I've heard is consistently across the panel the need to uh, reduce the emissions from existing supplies. Um, within the last, I think it was around right about last weekend, there was someone, I judge, one of the BBC programs, who talked very eloquently about the need to shift towards you know, reducing the impact of current technology, or cur current um, or fossil, basically reducing the impact of fossil fuels before you try and reduce fossil fuels, because and it seems to me that the the, the general media push, which has been had to be picked up by politicians, whether it's the race to zero or whatever, and the point that I saw being made, which I I I, I, I understood was actually by putting all of our energy in the race to zero. We're not putting enough energy and enough political impact onto reducing emissions with what we're going to have to live with. And you guys have all been saying, get real, you're going to have to live with this. Now, I know a Greco have, have been doing something on you know, flare gas um, power generation. So I would like to throw to the panel, I would like to hear from all of you on what needs to happen politically, what needs to happen on messaging. I know we're a conference, I know we're talking, but if we don't, actually start talking about what's needed, we may keep putting too much energy on something. We're ignoring what maybe we can do by reaching for something that we hope to get to someday. But actually, we'd say, so I'd be interested in the panel's view of what needs to happen in the, the political thing. I realize this is probably totally contradictory to um, uh, whatever the woke impressions are today. So anyway, so if, if I may, I'll, I'll, Hesham, if you can conduct them, yeah. but I want to hear your input as well, please. Can I start? It's a very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, maybe we, uh, as we said in the discussion, definitely we will still rely on existing fossil fuels. So this is something we cannot ignore. So in the process, I think we need to have the regulations and policies in place because this is how you can control the emissions of the existing uh, facilities. So this is very important to start with setting the policies and regulations uh, that will you know, ensure that uh, although we're continuing uh, on the existing uh, you know, uh, designs, but yet in a, in a more friendly, environmental friendly manner, and we're uh, looking into how to optimize and reduce the emissions. In, and in parallel, I would also recommend like uh, conducting, you know, the environmental impact assessment studies that can look into mitigation uh, measures that can be implemented. You know, because I mean, you, you need to, to 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 work on both fronts. You need to have the regulations and the guidelines, and also make sure that we have the technology and the the environmental measures that can in, in, uh, mitigate the implications and the negative impacts. And I guess so. On all projects, you know, uh, we, 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 there should be like an EIA and even environmental social impact assessment that can look into ways on how to improve the operation and mitigate the, 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 the emissions. That's from my side. Uh, thank you. So I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, in my experience, there has been a, a staggering lack of energy literacy um, uh, that has been displayed, uh, especially among sort of policymakers. Um, it is we, we are confusing forecasts with scenarios. We are misleading young people by telling them that we don't need oil and gas. Young people go out and demonstrate, and not just young people, climate activists, they go out and demonstrate and say, keep it in the ground. 
with pleasure the moment we don't need it. We cannot keep it in the ground. They literally think, and there's a, an article in the BBC this morning, slamming COP27 for having so many oil and gas companies present. You know, we need to just start being realistic uh, about where we are. So it, it is urgent, actually. This is, we need urgent action on this. Um, and I know that uh, across Europe, th this, is, this is a problem. It's less of a problem in the United States and, and in, de in developing countries, I guess, in Asia, in, a, in, a, in, in Africa, is not so much of a problem. Probably the biggest problem is in, in, in Europe. So we need to be honest with where we are. Sorry, John. Uh, yes, and make a plan based on facts, not getting re-elected. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, the speaker. So I'm, I'm going to need to be escorted out of the premises, I think, quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> just because of the time, I can see that we have a couple of hands there. Sure. So, okay. Thank you very much, panel, for a great um, conversation. Um, Valentina, I am going to use your new house, old house analogy the whole time. So we are a hydrogen business, my name's Tim, and we mend roofs and build new houses. Um, the reason we do both is partly because you need to do both, but also John's point about the war for talent, right? Those young activists, we employ them. So we have to do both, and you guys have to do both, because otherwise you won't get the new people that I met one of your team today, which is definitely a young person I'd like to steal if, uh, if you don't need them, but um, it was only a coffee, so we've only just started. But <laughs> being clear about um, uh, the war for talent is on. Um, my question is slightly different, right? So we're building roofs, we're building new houses. We get incredibly frustrated when the policymakers and politicians to win the next election basically incentivize people to build houses on quicksand. So my argument, question is, how do we make sure that incentives are allocated to the right new technologies, not the wrong ones that will never work? Well, that, that, how, how, to direct, how to direct incentives to the right sectors. Um, I truly believe that we need to do, have to have two parallel streams. So we need to have the stream where we are providing vision, investing in clean technologies, um, and, and having a dedicated pot of money. And quite a lot of it will have to be incentives because these projects, they don't make money, they don't make returns. And this is why we can't bridge that gap between trillions available and millions of projects waiting. So we simply have to, if we are going to have this Marshall Climate Plan, that has to be directed towards new technologies uh, and has to be supported by, with, with grants. Um, and then the second track is this kind of decarbonization of, of uh, existing systems. And that means, and that's really low hanging fruits. It's easy to do. We can see progress next year. I love that, you know, we, we don't have to wait until 2030, 2025. We can see progress next year. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take long to implement these initiatives. We just need to have understanding and acceptance that we are going to need oil and gas because actually when you go to to kind of many conferences, it's simply not on the agenda. <clears throat> no one wants to invest in oil and gas. And so we just have to have uh, this understanding and move, move ahead with it. As, as John says, we just, just do it, as Nike says. <laughs> Can I add a point? Uh, I think uh, to answer your question as well is, is we need to um, concentrate and focus on the quick wins that we can achieve because politicians will always want like, you know, to see success immediately and rather not wait for a long term solution. So uh, we need to strike the balance between what we can uh, achieve now and a long term effect will then, you know, come eventually. It will happen. Do you have anything to add, John? Conscious of time, 30 seconds. It's a great question, Tim. The, the thing that encourages me, 
the politicians and most importantly their officials they're not stupid they really get it and it, one of my frustrations is they say these things and then when the doors are shut and they're off the record they absolutely get it in spades they know all this stuff but their politicians are elected officials they're elected by a mandate of some people who asked them to do something and they kind of need to respect that but i think the quick wins it, 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 practically in the real world if we can just tee up quick wins and provide them, then if I was a politician, that would probably let me balance my mandate and my conscience of doing the right thing in the, in the short term. But it's just too slow. The whole thing is too slow in every front, in every country. That's our challenge. The challenge isn't some great philosophical, technical thing. It's getting on with it. Mark Davis from Capturio. Um, congratulations to the, many of the panelists and the members here for making really good initiatives to reduce emissions. Capricorn's talked about the, reducing gas flaring. I know Greco and Petrofac have been behind that too. The truth is that there is a massive opportunity. Um, but in, in being inspired by our concert pianists from the last session, they thought they won the waste competition, 30% water waste. Well, actually, we waste globally 7% of gas. And in Egypt, there's $6 billion of revenue opportunity at today's prices to be captured. So the and, and the, we, what we need to do to, to capture this is we need to get straight with the data. I've not heard data mentioned in this session. Data is key. When we have data, we can make informed decisions. We can prioritize the investments. Unfortunately, my question was sort of stolen by the man at the front. But the real question is, given the scale is so large, given that finance wants to do it, given that governments want implementation, given that doers want to do, now is the time to act. Can we please get going and start accelerating our mission? And I really like to just encourage us to figure out how we change the political system, how we unlock the bureaucratic uh, blockers to make this happen, because Egypt's got an amazing opportunity. So let's go after it. It's not really a question, sorry. <laughs> We've got a seat for you up the front here if you want to come and join. Uh, Alice Monroe, I, I actually have a very blunt question. So we heard yesterday from Minister Halla about two and a half million people in Egypt, just one country alone, increasing every year. We hear about the industrialization, we hear about the increased quality of life, which means increased energy consumption. And we hear percentages, um, Dr. Valentina said 60%. But that's 60 percent of a much bigger pie because energy consumption is continuously increasing with population growth so the blunt question is is net zero realistic and in any credible time zone whether it be one or two generations is it possible to achieve it or is this just a false illusion um i can i can uh start with with that so um i was asked recently by uh one of the industry leaders a ceo of a renewables company he actually went around the table asking people when we thought net zero would be achieved he gave options 2030 2050 2100 never and i just looked <laughs> in in total surprise that actually net zero uh, has been completely decoupled from climate goals. What does it mean? What does it mean to you net zero? Net zero by 2100, what is it? Net zero is a strategy that we have deployed to a, try to achieve 1.5 degree warming by 2100. We now know that we can't get there. So, Alistair, to answer your question, we can't get there. So, net zero as a climate strategy by 2050 is not achievable globally. Does it mean that we are going to abandon net zero, given that many companies have changed their logos and names into net zero? They're not happy. They would be not, not happy changing them back. Um, I don't think we need to drop net zero. Net zero could become a goal in and of itself. We should all strive towards achieving net zero. So when we can achieve it, well, we can achieve it. But, you know, for us in Capricorn, we, we, we have a target of 2040. We are trying to align and actually accelerate with the most ambitious Paris climate, uh, climate goals. But if you're, you know, a country like 
Egypt or, uh, you know, anywhere in China, for example, India, they have committed to net zero by 2070. Well, that's, that's fine. Okay, we need, to, we need to try to get there. But net zero as a strategy that has been initially set to achieve 1.5 degree uh, limit, limits uh, to 1.5 degree warming by 2100 is off the table. I just want to add what Dr. Valentina said. I do believe applying the energy efficiency and the energy transition will be giving the chance to net zero to be more applicable as soon as we can. So whatever it will happen, but we need to apply these two because they, they are applicable and these two factors are, can, be, can be done now. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I think net zero should become our purpose. We should be driven by net zero. It should be our corporate purpose. And the sooner we can achieve it, the better. And constantly high grade our goals. Start, start with 2050 and then if we can achieve it sooner, well, let's do it because we know that we should not be polluting. Thank you. Yeah, we, we talked about data and, and there's, there's certainly plenty of science around. It's nearly as good as data, isn't it? And, and to me, the science says, can we get to net zero? Absolutely, you can. It's a bit like me trying to get to a sub 40, 10K time. Theoretically, I could do it. Practically, am I going to do it? Well, that's my choice, isn't it? Do I want to spend all my time running? But I'm an optimist. I, I absolutely believe if we do the things we've said we're going to do, we can get to net zero emissions unquestionably. I absolutely don't disagree with Valentina's comments about the, the temperature rise that we'll get to by the time we've figured out to get to net zero. But that's a different thing. Hi there, um, my name is Kathy Wardle and I'm Sustainability Director at Perkins & Well, uh, one of uh, DAR's partner organizations. Um, I represent a global architecture firm and there was a comment just about um, what governments can do and I want to just provide one example. So I, I reside in Vancouver, Canada and the province of British Columbia implemented the BC Energy Step Code. And what the Energy Step Code does is it provides local governments with a roadmap to this transition so that we can actually help municipalities implement building regulations in a stepped manner so that um, builders, developers, our clients understand where they need to go in implementing better performing buildings over a period of time to 2030. And what that is doing is helping the uh, transition in terms of supply chain talent retention, capacity building, because we know that we don't necessarily have the trades on the ground to actually implement the solutions. So as we talk about a net zero transition, we need to think about the people on the ground who are actually delivering um, the technology, who are building, who are implementing. We can't forget about those people. And I think the, providing a road, roadmap sends a signal about how industry, uh, construction sector um, partners, can get there. So I don't know if the panel wants to respond about capacity building in, at a local level. May I add a quick comment to that? So, uh, credit to governments, which is unusual for me to say, but they, 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 they're really causing real things to happen. Whether it's a uh, carbon economics in the UK or hydrogen strategy, things are definitely happening. To your point on skills, I completely agree. The craft labor, as we'd say in, in North America, or the, the blue collar is massively harder than the white collar. I've got 10,000 people desperate to come and join new energy services in Petrofac because it's cool and it's what everyone wants to do. But the, the people who will physically build the job is a much larger challenge. And that, that is going to be one of the crucial limitations to getting stuff done in the real world. And we need, we need to get after this now because their employment proposition is quite different to a white collar worker. Hope this answered the question. So thank you, John. So due to the time, I do believe that we've finished our time slot. One more question. Okay, please. Considering the built environment, uh, if we consider actually uh, uh, the new greenfield projects, there are many measures and techniques that uh, can help to decarbonize these uh, new buildings and developments. But what about uh, exist existing brownfields development? What measures are there uh, to decarbonize these? Thank you. 
I think Hazem is probably a better place to answer that. But just one thing that uh, has come out of more recent discussions with the European Commission uh, body that looks into ETS, Emission Trading System, in, in a couple of years' time, buildings are going to be included in the emissions trading system in the European Union, for example. And this is going to be sort of a huge push towards decarbonization uh, of both new and existing buildings. So on the regulatory side, that's, that's one of the key elements. I think also relying on the artificial intelligence we talked about earlier, having smart meters, having uh, measures that are set in place that can optimize the operation of the existing green fields, existing buildings. This will enable us to uh, achieve uh, or improve on the, even if it's not zero carbon, but at least it will improve the, the emissions and the impact on the environment. I think uh, going back to one of the questions that was answered, whether we will achieve zero carbon or not, I don't think the, 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 we need to measure, you know, whether it's zero or not zero, but I think we all need to work together to improve the current situation. Uh, and I guess we need to have like KPI set in place. And this is, this should be again tied to the regulations and the uh, guidelines that we discussed earlier. Uh, you know, how do you measure uh, success and how do you measure whether you have achieved it or not? Zero might not, be, might be very difficult to achieve in the near future, but at least if we do, if you all do something, we will improve the, the, the current conditions. Thank you. There's millions of things you can do on brownfield sites, millions. Start, start by how do you just operate and maintain them? You know, use biodiesel, not ordinary diesel. Don't use diesel at all. You know, think about where you get your steel and your concrete from. I could go on and on and on, but I won't. There, it's, it's a mindset, but it all costs slightly more because you have to change. It might cost less eventually, that people have to put their money where their mouth is, otherwise you'll get what you get. But the good news is there's so much that can be done. Thank you, everyone. So uh, at the end, I just want to thank Biba and EPCC for hosting such an interesting discussion. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a lovely, productive day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, just my thanks from, from the chamber, really, for the, the whole panel. Um, I think it, it, it's interesting as we go through this. Um, I, I, I had to do something very early on in the Blue Zone. I saw some um, discussions going on there. Um, I even took some pictures through the glass windows where there were more people on the panel than there were in the audience. So I, I think the fact that everyone has turned up to hear you shows the level of interest. I'm grateful to you for the realism that you've been bringing. And I think there's probably going to be a lot of discussions around COP27 that fail to address the real issues. Um, and you know, we may well have, you, we, we won't have it in, in Egypt, but in the UK, we have got young people gluing themselves to the roads to stop oil being used. Um, I, I, they're gonna get very hungry over the next 20 years. Um, and, I, I, and I think we, we, the realism that you were bringing today, I think is really helpful. Um, but there are things we can do. And I, my feeling is we have to move the political debate to get the politicians to be able to do what their voters insist that they, they, they try to do. So that I think you've, you've brought that really forward for us today. So panel, thank you. And Hesham, thank you for steering us through this. If, if I may, just before we say full thanks, and to those of you here in a minute, um, we're going to be going through basically at the end of two days session for both Biba and the Egyptian British Chamber of Commerce. Um, we're going to have um, a relatively short closing, um, probably an hour, um, where um, Alistair Long, who is the HM um, De Deputy Trade Commissioner for um, uh, the UK in, in Africa. And we're going to be joined just a, a, through this session, we're going to be joined by um, Mahmoud Mohuldin. Um, so, I mean, as always with ministers, we are absolutely confident that he's coming and we will believe it when he appears. Um, but he's, prom he's promised us um, he's going to be here by one o'clock. So um, thank, thank you for, and uh, you know, you're welcome to go, but I wouldn't, this might be interesting. So panel, thank you, thank you. Hesham, thank you. Thank you very much.